it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Kyung Yun Cho. So Cho is an assistant professor uh, of computer science and data science at New York University and a research scientist in Facebook AI research. He was a postdoctoral fellow with Joshua Bengio in Montreal, and he received his PhD and master's degree from Malto University in early 2014 under the supervision of uh, Juha Karhunen. Am I pronouncing that right? Good enough, yeah. good enough. Uh, and Tapani Raiko and Alexander Irin. Um, and according to his bio, he tries uh, his best to find a balance among machine learning, natural language processing, and life, but almost always fails to do so. Um, on a personal note, the first talk I, I saw Cho gave was in 2016 in the Deep Learning Summer School in Montreal. And the person that introduced him was a, a much more intelligent person called Joshua Bengio, who introduced Cho as a blazing star passing through his lab onto bigger things. So without further ado, here's Cho. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for the generous introduction and then you know, thanks for inviting me over here. It's my first time ever in Latin America and you know, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Except for the breakfast this morning, I've had steak every single meal, including the lunch right now. <laughs> so I like it. Uh, and then what I, uh, I went through the list of the speakers of this event and then it's a fascinating list the organizers have been able to compile. And then what I decided was, you know, if I started talking about my latest research, then I won't be able to compete against them. So I'm going to go through the very basics of the language modeling and the machine translation so as to maximize the whole purpose of this event that is to be, I heard the summer school or the spring school, depending on you know, where you're from. But from me, it's like the winner's school. And then, you know, unlike what Nando said at the very beginning on Sunday, Facebook did sponsor this event, and then Facebook did send some person, and that is me. <laughs> so don't, don't hate us that much. I mean, like, we are being hated by a lot of people, but you know, at least hopefully we have a few less, a fewer pe people hating us. Sorry? What? And David, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where is David? Yes, so Facebook sent two people so you should like us twice more. <laughs> so I, I thought I'm going to do some recap of the supervised learning in order to kind of set up the foundation on which we're going to talk about how to build a language model and then ultimately how to build a machine translation system. And to do so, we need to talk about supervised learning. Although the thing that we're going to talk about in terms of language model is the oral regressive model that you have already heard about earlier this morning by Ian. By Ian. However, it turned out that everything can be framed as a set of supervised learning problems. So for supervised learning, we are going to set up some very basics here. So we assume that we are provided with a set of n many input output uh, training examples or the concepts. And then we are going to assume for now that somebody is going to give us a loss function or that we can actually design some kind of proxy loss function that I'm going to talk about soon. And then what we're going to assume is that we're going to be given an evaluation set in addition to the training set. So we're going to have three sets in total, one training set, and then validation set, and test set. And it turned out to be extremely important and is an interesting, uh, let's say, departure from the usual supervised learning that you would learn from the introduction to machine learning, where you're going to be taught that, okay, you got to do the leave one out cross-validation or the careful cross-validation, because the, uh, the regime in which we're going to work with is where we have the millions, if not billions, or even more training examples. And then hopefully, if the time permits, I'm going to also talk about the, some kind of low resource language processing where we're going to be given only a small amount of data points. However, where we are going to use a millions of the data points from another language in order to get the best generalization performance out. And then once we're given all those three things, we need to decide on two things. One is the hypothesis set. So we're going to decide what kind of models we're going to test. And then we need to decide on the optimization algorithm or a learning algorithm that allows us to find a good solution within each of the hypotheses. set. Too high level, let's go a bit further. So when I say hypothesis set, it's again from a very basic concept, but here what I want you to think of is that the, so I've been reading all those papers about how to build a language model using the recurrent neural nets, LSTMs, transformers, convolutional neural nets. <coughs> And then each and every one, uh, which one should I use? And then there in this question, each and every one of those choices is going to give you a hypothesis set or the space. And then 
in that space, you have all possible different parameter configurations, right? So let's say you decided to use the transformer base from the Ashish Baswani's paper from 2017, attention is all you need. But what you notice is that there is one model, however, there's infinitely many instantiations of them. Because every time you change the parameter little by little, you get a different model. Of course, if you look at the actual function, that may not actually be the case. However, you can see how there could be infinitely many of them. And then if you decided to use the convolutional networks, then you run into the same issue. So every time we're going to choose a network, we're going to say that, okay, here's a hypothesis space within which we need to do the search or learning, right? That op optimization procedure is going to get us the best model within that architecture or the hypothesis set. And then how we do that is by using the optimization algorithm and the training set. So we assume that we had a training set. So we're going to use millions, if not billions, of the data points trying to figure out, OK, with among, uh, within this hypothesis that defined by, let's say, transformer large or the base, what is the best one that we can use? And then once we do that, we need to now decide, OK, are we going to stick to transformer? Are we going to stick to convolutional network? Are we going to stick to LSTM? Or are we going to stick to GRU? Not the name of the airport that I stopped by, <laughs> which was really nice. I took a picture self in front of it as well. So how do we do that? Right? All of them look really, really nice if, because you're, uh, if you look at the training examples, because that's precisely how you found them. So what we need is the second set that is a validation set in order to choose which one of those very interesting network architectures that we are going to use. And what we do is that we are going to pick one of them and then see how well it works on the validation set and then based on which we choose one of the hypothesis set or the model. And then now this is often where my students, both in the grad school as well as the undergrad, ask me the question about, okay, why do we need the third set? And then we're going to use that third set to report how well the selected model does. So what do I mean by the reporting? Let's say you are working at a company building a product that is using some kind of machine learning algorithm. Now you collected some data, you use a training set in order to find a good solution for each of the hypothesis set. Now you can decide to use a support vector machines, you can decide to use a confnet, or maybe you can use the self-attention, which was mentioned briefly earlier by Ian. Well, actually it wasn't mentioned because it was cut off at the end. But then, now you, need, you are going to choose one of them using the validation set. But what you need to do is that eventually you need to go to your manager or the boss or the, your client saying that, okay, how well this one, you gotta tell them how well it's going to work in practice. And then you cannot use the training accuracy, validation accuracy, or anything else, but the accuracy that you would compute using a set of test examples that you, has, you have not even looked at before you, compute, you measure this generalization ability. And then this is what you're going to use to report. So throughout this lecture, what we're going to do is we are going to simply assume that we never touch the test examples unless it's time for you to write a paper or write a report and then you know, bring it to your client, both or the reviewers. Okay, so, so far so good. And then what ends up doing with the supervised learning, once we have this, let's say, data sets that includes both the training validation test sets and the loss function that was either given or to which the, you can find the proxy. You have the set of hypothesis set and the optimization algorithm. And with all this, supervised learning is effectively a way to find an approximate algorithm automatically. So it's a very different way of thinking about what, machine, uh, what the computer science is. So in computer science, if you remember, in the very first class of the computer, any kind of computer science education, you're told that the, what you're going to do is to figure out how to come up with or, or write an algorithm that's going to solve a problem. So what you're given is a problem, and then you're going to look at the problem really, really carefully, and then give a lot of thought, and then you're going to write down a sequence of procedures that's going to solve this problem. However, in machine learning, what we are now doing is to go the other way around. We are going to be given a very rough specification of a problem, so looking at the problem more uh, over and over doesn't really tell us how to solve the problem. So something like, okay, get me the uh, build a, uh, okay, I want to build a program that's going to detect faces on a picture. There is no way you can actually write a specific, a very specified description of what the problem is. There's so much variabilities that you cannot, that no one can ever take into account fully. But what we now have is that we have a set of examples from which we can now extract or build an algorithm automatically using these supervised learning algorithms. 
And then our goal in this supervised learning is to find this algorithm with an expected, uh, with the best or the best expected performance that I'm going to use with the R of M hat. And doing so, there are a few things that we need to do. First is that, okay, how do we design or the decide a hypothesis set? And then here, we're going to stick only to the neural networks. And then, you know, of course, there are so many different ways to do so other than neural networks. Or some might say that the everything else is just the neural networks, right? So in the case of the classification, you can think about using the support vector machines, naive based classifiers, or logistic regression, and then all you need to do is choose one of them. And then in the regression, you can also similarly do the support vector regression, linear regression, Gaussian process, so on and so on. There are infinitely many possible one of them. And then what it's saying is that the we choose each one of them, but then for each one of them, we have a different set of, uh, sets of hyperparameters that we need to choose. If you decided to use a convolution on your nets, you need to think about how many layers of the convolution you're going to have, and how each convolutional block would look like. Would you have the residual connection or the dense connection, or then you idea what is going to be the size of the filters, and on and on. And then every time you decide on some hyperparameter set, then that's going to create a hypo new hypothesis space. So you're going to have like so many of them, and then if you work at, for instance, Google, then you're going to have, let's say, exponentially many of them, so that you don't run into the issue of the curse of dimensionality. However, in reality, you have to really think a lot and then try to decide a reasonable or the manageable set of hypothesis spaces. So in neural network, as I said, there are many different ways to go, and then that choice of the network architecture has been one of the driving forces behind the advances in applying deep learning to various problems. So if you look here, we have the one network that was used in 2012 by Alex Krzyzewski to tackle the problem of the object recognition with using an ImageNet data set. And then that was massively successful. But after about four years, this is from the 2016 by the Google people, you can see that the network looks extremely different. The only thing that you can see as the, that has stayed the same is that the input and output are the same thing. Input is going to be an image, output is going to be the distribution over 1,000 categories, but within it, it just doesn't look at all like the uh, original AlexNet. And then now, once we choose which network we're going to use, now we need to try to think about how our hypothesis that looks like, and then it turned out that it's extro exponentially large. Uh, it's actually infinitely large, and then we need to use some kind of optimization algorithm. And at this point, you, gotta, you ask a question. How the hell are we going to choose this one, right? So that's actually a big, big problem. So it looks super complicated. I have absolutely no idea how Google team came up with this Google Net. And then I was looking at it, so it's not even one input, one output case. There is a one input, but there are a number of outputs. And then they called it like the, uh, was it like the heavy on learning inspire something, but I don't think that was their inspiration. I think they somehow randomly came up with this and then it worked really well. What it means is that there is absolutely no reason for me to actually talk about the details. So we're going to work at a slightly abstract level where I'm going to say a neural net is an arbitrary directed acyclic graph. What it means is that in this graph, we're going to have some inputs. So those are the nodes where there's no edges or the arrows coming in. And then there will be nodes where who, there's no arrow going out. And then in between, we're going to have a bunch of nodes with the directed connections. And at each of the nodes, we're going to compute some kind of computation. It could be summation, a fine transformation, maybe some kind of nonlinear, let's say, uh, activation, and on and on. And then once we start working at this kind of directed acyclic graph, then we can actually talk about all the other things without having, been, having to be boggled down by the details of how, let's say, how many layers you gotta have for ResNet, or what kind of connect connectivity patterns you need to have for the dense net, and so on. And for that, you just read the latest CVPR papers, and then there are going to be, let's say, 100 different models every year. So what do I mean by the directed acyclic AC graph? Let's look at a couple of the examples. So the logistic regression is the most basic thing that you learn in the machine learning classes, where the goal is to give some kind of input, multi-dimensional input, trying to get me the probability distribution over this example being, uh, belonging to either 0 or 1. So it's going to be just a binary class, class classification. And then what we start with is that we have the input x, and then we have the two different inputs, which I'm going to refer to as the parameters, the weight and bias. 
And then how I build the directed ACI click graph is to put the dot product first between the input and the weight, and then have the addition that is between the output of this dot product and the by vector. And then that is going to be fed into another, the final computational node that is the applying the sigmoid function that squashes whatever the value within between, uh, between zero and one. And then now you can actually, you realize that you can write almost any kind of functions of interest in this directed ACI click graph, like the, whatever the nth order polynomial function you want, all you need to do is to have a n many or the o n many nodes there. And then what we call inference in this graph is just a forward computation. So we're going to start from some input and then inputs almost always uh, include the parameters. And then we're going to just compute it one step at a time that is following the topological order or the breadth first uh, span sweep. And then we end up with the output. So what it means is that the every time you create this kind of directed ACI click graph, you create a hypothesis set, right? So this directed ACI click graph tells you about the, what the network architecture is, and then what the hyperparameters that you have decided to use. And then the, it's really nice. It has a very nice implication, not only in the pedagogical sense, but also in practice. Because it naturally supports high-level abstraction, it actually fits very well with the many of the programming paradigms that we have, like the object-oriented programming paradigm or even the functional programming paradigm. And also, it allows us to maximize the code reusability. And then you, know, you can see that from the success of the PyTorch, TensorFlow, Dynet, Theano, Theano has de uh, died. So OK, that one, probably not the success. But the, and then many other uh, libraries is, that are being created almost every day. And then here, all these paradigms, what it supports is for you to build very easily the directed ACI click graph. And then how each and every node is implemented is all hidden below these frameworks. Then you don't have to really worry too much about it. Right? So then one, now you know how to define the hypothesis set using any of those frameworks. And then it's really, really simple. Once you get used to it, you just open up the Jupyter notebook, write down the, some kind of network, and then training it on a very complicated data set often takes only about 100 lines of the code, even fewer if you use yet another uh, library that provides a yet another level of the abstraction. But then we need to decide on the loss function. This is the one thing that cannot really be easily done automatically unless we start thinking about a bit about the, uh, in a probabilistic way. So the, if you think about just a loss function, what that loss function tells me is that, OK, I have this my network or the model. Now, it needs to tell me how well this model does on a particular example. So we're going to stick to so-called per-example loss function or the decomposable loss function here. And then, now, a bit weird thing is that you can come up with infinitely many different ways to measure how good your prediction is. and then that alone is a gigantic field in machine learning. You know, like for the classification, there is an original 0, 1 loss, there is a hinge loss, log loss, on and on. For the regression, you're going to think about the mean square error, maybe the mean absolute error, maybe some kind of robust error, and so on and so on. It's kind of difficult for me to actually go over all of them here within two hours. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to stick to probabilistic framework and then saying that the Every network that we're going to design or the build is going to output some kind of distribution. That is the conditional distribution over all possible answers given input. And once we say that that is the case, then we can now design the loss function automatically by simply saying that the, a, good, a good model should put a high log probability on the correct answer. So that's the only thing that we need to say. So then once we decide what is the distribution that is being outputted by a neural network, we can now automatically tell, OK, what is the log probability of the correct answer? And then because we want to always put it into the cost or the loss that we want to minimize, we're going to simply say our loss is going to be the negation of that. So it's going to be a negative log probability of the correct answer. So to, before going in there, so let's talk about the categorical distribution just quickly, because that is going to be the only distribution that we are going to actually care about in my lecture. And then the goal here is to build a neural net that's going to take, in, take as the input some kind of, let's say, arbitrary input, and then outputs a distribution over fixed number of the classes. So let's say there are C many classes. And how can you do that is that you need to build a neural net that's going to output C many real values numbers, 
And then we are going to somehow normalize it, that is by exponentiate it and then divide it by the sum to turn, them, turn those numbers into the actual probabilities. And then the normalization is often called the softmax normalization here. And then by, so in other words, it really doesn't matter how you build this kind of network because that has been, that's the thing that you can be as creative as possible about. But all you need to do is you just build up this directed acyclic graph that's going to take as the input something that you have and then outputs this C many real values vectors followed by the softmax. And then suddenly this network is going to give you the categorical distribution. And then once you have this categorical distribution, your loss function is automatically the ne negative log probability of the correct class because your network actually gives you the probabilities for all possible classes. All you need to do is just take one of them and then trying to maximize the probability assigned to the correct answer. It's going to get clearer a bit later. Of course, you can build the same thing for the Gaussian, but I'm not going to talk about Gaussian because we're not going to use it at all. So this is what I meant by the computing the negative log probability is that the, what we want is to go through all the examples that you have and then trying to ensure that the, your model is going to output a distribution where the probability corresponding to the correct class is going to be maximized. So eventually in the limit, we want it to have the one probability of one whenever the answer is correct. And then simply we choose one, right? And then for the loss, we just negate it. That's about it. And then often it turned out that what we can do is we can also put this whole, let's say, negative log probability as a block in this directed acyclic graph. So really what we are doing is to build this, you know, it's almost like playing with the Lego. We are given some input and the parameters, and the, what we do is we're going to put these blocks together with each other so that eventually it's going to get us a single number that is the negative log probability of the correct answer. And then what we do is simply to put, give this to PyTorch, for instance, and then let it compute or the implement exactly how things are going to implement it. Well, are we using TensorFlow generally in the, this week? No PyTorch? So that's a great idea, yes. PyTorch is a great idea, yes. <laughs> and I've, I've used MATLAB, Theano, uh, MXNet, PyTorch, and then TensorFlow. I think the PyTorch is actually the way to go, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I see some, you know, at the thumbs up there, right? So then, uh, okay, so we now know how to build a neural network and as a directed acyclic graph, and then we somehow learned that the loss function itself can be very abstracted out by building your neural net to output a distribution. So it's all about suddenly the directed acyclic graph that you need to build. Now the next question is how do we optimize this loss function? And then you know, it's almost like these days when you go listen to some of the talks on let's say computer vision, natural language processing or so on that uses machine learning, the optimization is almost given. Is that, yo, oh, we're going to, here's a loss function, here's a network architecture, here's a problem, and then here's a data set, and then we're going to somehow fit it. And then it's always confusing you know, what they are actually exactly doing. So we're going to just look at uh, quick things. And then you know, we are going to just talk about the gradient-based optimization, how it, which is, however, not the only option. And if this whole directed acyclic graph that you have built is differentiable, where the output of this is differentiable with respect to all the parameters that were, let's say, weight vectors, bias vectors, and so on, then what we can do is now we can compute the gradient of this whole graph with respect to the parameters. And then the gradient actually tells us what is the direction in which we change the parameters to maximize or to increase the actual loss function computed. So what we're going to do is we just put the negative there, negation there, and then take a very small step along that direction. And then this looks pretty simple. That's actually true. If you remember from your, for instance, high school, let's say, mathematics courses, then what you learn is that you compute the, uh, you differentiate a function, and then you, we learn that that's the slope. So what we are saying is that, okay, that's the slope that we want to take, right? It turned out that the, this algorithm is highly effective and efficient, even in a very high dimensional space. And then where we say, when I say high dimension, it's like the million or tens of million, if not billions of the dimensional space. In that kind of space, it turned out that it's almost impossible to use a second order information like the Hessian or the Fisher information matrix. However, it turned out that so far in the whole field of the deep learning, none of them has been useful. 
I mean, like the, I wrote some papers on that as well, but I don't use it. So I think that's actually a pretty good confirmation that the, all we need to stick to is the gradient-based optimization. If anybody tells you otherwise, I think they are wrong. So. <laughs> so what it does is that if we are going to have some kind of complicated loss function in this space of the parameters, we start from some random points, and then we want to just follow these gradients little by little until we stop somewhere. And then this one works re reasonably well because we know how to compute this gradient really, really efficiently. And then that is thanks to this abstraction of the whole neural net as a directed acyclic graph. So if you remember, again, from the high school mathematics or the, let's say, first year of your uh, undergrad years, there is something called chain rule of derivative. So we talked about the chain rule of the probabilities or the conditional probabilities earlier today. However, there is also the chain rule of the derivatives. What it means is that in order to compute a uh, derivative of a very complicated composite function, what we need to do is we need to be able to compute the gradient or uh, Jacobian of each of those functions in the composite chain. And then once you can do that, you can actually just chain them up to compute the gradient of the very final loss function that you have with respect to the weight uh, parameters that were at the very, very beginning of this composite function. And then what it means is that the, in terms of implementation, we just need to know how to compute this Jacobian vector product at each of the nodes in the directed graphical model. Let's say if I have a very deep convolutional neural network, I won't implement how to compute this gradient of the new network from scratch, but what I'm going to do is that for each convolutional layer, how the gradient should be computed by multiplying whatever has been passed on from the earlier, uh, later pass with the Jacobian there. And then this can be implemented really, really efficiently. Again, all those frameworks that you use, PyTorch, TensorFlow, all of them implemented for you. So all we need to do is, it turned out, just make this directed acyclic graph, and then let these frameworks compute all these chained grad, uh, derivatives for you. So what is the practical implement, implication of the automatic differentiation, or at least the reverse mode automatic differentiation, is that the, all you need to do is really, again, just build a directed acyclic graph. That is your neural net, and then you decide the loss function. And then you let the underlying framework decide what is the right way or the optimal way to compute the gradient for you based on whatever the compute backend that, has been, that you have provided to the framework. It could be using single GPU, maybe multiple GPUs. Perhaps the computation could be distributed over the multiple machines. But all those things can be pretty much opaque to you because that is the job of the framework after, uh, in order to get you this kind of abstraction of the directed acyclic grid graph. And then once you do that, you do the gradient descent optimization. But let me just go to one step here. Where, how, what is the right way to actually stop learning? And then this, I, I need to talk about it because it turned out to be extremely important, especially when you build these language models, the machine translation models, because weirdly so, even with the billions of the data points, we always overfit. So we did yesterday, or uh, did see that, the, okay, there is a weird, let's say, double descent kind of thing where as we make our models larger and larger, then the generalization gets better and better. That's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true. And in reality, when we build a tra gigantic transformer or the LSTMs with, let's say, tens or hundreds of the millions of parameters, and then we try to fit that mo model on, let's say, millions or tens of the millions of examples, that model is going to overfit. So we really need to do something called all this stopping that we heard about yesterday based on how well the model works on the validation set. And in the case of the language or the structure of the prediction, it's not the perplexity. Although earlier today, Ian actually talked a lot about the perplexity for the language-related stuff, but we actually rarely care about perplexity. So what we care about is how well you can actually generate or that your model can generate the answer that is the valid sentence. And then for that, it's not really the perplexity, but that is the mix of the training as well as inference and the task-based loss that we don't know how to compute the gradient with respect to. So the only stopping is really important. And then we, for that, we need to really have a nice validation set set aside. And then how you set aside the validation turned out to be crucial, especially in the case of the language, because the language is never a fixed thing. 
So for instance, cats, cats versus dogs. Cats and dogs look exactly the same. They look exactly the same in the ancient Egypt or you know, like even before the humans were there. Well, not some of the dogs. Some of the dogs become really weird because of the human intervention. <laughs> However, when you think about text, the text that you get, news articles you get from last year, and news articles that you're going to get from this year are very, very different because topics uh, drift and the vocabularies change, and then even the grammars evolve over time. So the choice of the validation set and how you do the early stopping has a gigantic impact on how your model is going to work. And for instance, in the case of machine translation, it is very customary to always use the temporal ordering to split the data. So we're going to use the training data sets from the past and then validate your model on the current and then trying to report how well it's going to work on the future. It kind of doesn't make any sense to train a model on the future and then test it on the past. So that is really important. So the early stopping really needs to be implemented really well. And then how you implement the early stopping is also the kind of details that nobody talks about, but it's really important. So the name seems to suggest that the, what we do is that we do the optimization, and then we're going to stop early while monitoring the validation loss. And then when the validation loss stops improving, we're going to stop. Turned out that that's actually a really horrible strategy in general. And then what you want is to you just train a model as much as you can until nothing really changes in terms of the training loss. And then while doing so, you save once a while those checkpoints or the intermediate weights. And then you're going to, you should evaluate every single one of them on the validation set separately. And then choose the one with the lowest validation loss. And then that loss doesn't have to be perplexity or anything. And then by doing so, what we can do is we can really choose the one that is good by avoiding any kind of premature stopping of training. And then if you really just set the oh, patient something with some kind of, let's say, threshold and so on, you notice that you almost always stop too early. And then the actual gap that you notice in, the, in practice is going to be pretty large. So I'm not going to talk about adaptive learning rate too much. OK, so <laughs> all right, so it was just a recap. And then you're going to see why you know, I keep, we kept the supervised learning, because language modeling, machine translation, everything is nothing but a supervised learning problem, at least the ones that we are using or the ones that are running on your phone at the moment. So what do I mean by uh, language model is nothing but supervised learning? Of course, we got to talk about what language model is. So who's familiar with what language model is here? Oh, OK. It's surprisingly a lot as well as supplying a few. Yes. So it's a really simple problem. It's an extremely simple problem. That is, I want to build a machine that's going to tell me a probability or how likely a given sentence is. And it's a very typical unsupervised learning problem or the density estimation problem. That is, this machine should be able to give me a score for any possible sentence and then any sentences that are likely or are the sentences that are similar to the sentences in the training set has to have a high score, while any sentence that is not should have a very, very low score. So the input is a sentence, and then sentence is really nothing but a sequence of symbols. And then whether the symbol is word, letters, or bytes, or bits, doesn't really matter in our case. So it's a very typical unsupervised learning problem. And then one really successful approach so far has been so-called autoregressive sequence modeling, or a fully visible belief nets, as uh, Ian called earlier this today. And then the idea is that the probability of a sequence or a sentence can be rewritten as product of probability of the next token, given all the previous tokens. So if I have any kind of sentence, the probability of this sentence is going to be expressed express as a product of probability of the first word, probability of the second word given the first word, probability of the third one given the first two words, and on and on. And then it kind of, let's say, fits our intuition pretty well, right? So what will be the procedure by which we sample from this distribution if we follow this autoregressive sequence model? We're going to sample from the P of x1. We're going to generate sample. And then given that, we're going to generate the second sample from the P of x2 given x1. And then we do it over and over. And then if you think about how you speak, that's precisely what you do. You don't go back in time to fix anything. You just spit out one word at a time, 
until this sentence ends. And then what this way of writing this probability of a sequence implies is that if we have somehow turned this whole unsupervised learning problem into a series of supervised learning problem. If I look at just one of the conditionals there, so let's say I'm going to look at p of x2 given x1, or let's look at the p of x3 given x1 and x2, what the distribution does is simply to take as the input x1 and x2, the first two words, and then it, uh, we ask the neural net to give us the distribution over the next word, where the next word could be any one of the words in the vocabulary. So we take out one dictionary, and then we're saying, oh, every word that we can find in this dictionary is a class to which the previous words or the previous sequence of words belongs. So it's just text classification problem. And then all we need to do is solve this one problem, know how to solve this one problem of predict the next word or to decide to which word the previous words belongs. And then it turned out that this, oh, see lecture two, that's not for this lecture. Okay, that's my bad. So what you, how you build this kind of model, so we're going to look at this kind of directed acyclic graph. So what we start with is that we start with the x1, x2, xt minus one, so those are the previous tokens. And then how we're going to represent each token is as an integer index. So we don't really care too much about the actual language in this specific case, and then in general, natural language processing in modern days. It could be Spanish, it could be English, it could be Korean, it doesn't really matter, because we're going to, again, abstract ourselves away a bit from the actual language. And what it means is that the each token in our, for our purpose is going to be an integer index that tells us, if I look at this dictionary, which word does this index correspond to? So if you have a sentence that says the cat sat on the mat, then we're going to replace the the with, let's say, index one, because that's often the most frequent word in English. Cat is, going, cat is getting more and more frequent thanks to YouTube, so we're going to e replace it with the 1002. And then said is also pretty frequent, so we're going to replace it with the 99. On and on, we're going to now have a sequence of integer indices. And then we don't really care what the actual semantics is. And then each one of them is going to go into a layer, something called table lookup. And the, the table lookup layer is nothing but a layer that replaces this integer index with a corresponding vector. So it's really nothing but a fine transformation or the linear transformation. You have a gigantic matrix where each row corresponds to a vector of the one of the, um, one of the indices. And then all we do is we're going to slice them out. So what it means is that the after this table lookup layer, we now have a sequence of vectors where each vector corresponds to or that represents the corresponding word in the input, whatever that word is. We're not going to impose any kind of knowledge on that. And then once we have that kind of representation that is a sequence of the vectors, then we're going to average them and then get some kind of ve uh, vectorized representation that is going to sentence representation based on which we need to compute the probabilities or the real values that correspond to all possible words in the target sentence or the next word that, goes in, that go into the softmax to provide us with the actual distribution. So it's really just a classifier that we talked about. There is the input. There is some kind of arbitrary directed acyclic graph that's going to take as the input, both the input, and input sequence and the weight and the parameters, and then tries to give us a single vector that, course, that contains the probabilities over all possible words. And then what we do is, okay, so what should happen with these probabilities that have computed by this network is that the, we are simply going to look at the log of those probabilities, and then we look at what the correct next word should be. In the example of the duck cancer on the mat, and then we're going to look at the third word, then we build this neural net to consume the cat, the first two words, and it's going to give us the distribution over all possible words in this vocabulary or the, our dictionary. And then what we need to do is we need to take out the probability of set, and then we want to maximize the log of the probability. So it turned out we've been 
thinking a lot, and the whole field of the natural language processing has been obsessed with the language model ever since the 80s. But it turned out that all we need to do is just build a very, very powerful classifier that is going to classify any prefix into one of the words, unique words in the vocabulary. And then once, let's say, assume that we have this model, then we can use this model to score any given sentence. And then that's pretty straightforward. So if I wanted to score a sentence, for instance, in Korea, more than half of residents speak Korean, then I'm going to let our model to tell me what is the probability of in, the word in, being the very first one. And then once I compute that, I'm going to ask my model, okay, what is the probability of Korea following the word in? And then what should be the probability of the red, uh, more follow just simply multiply all of them, and then that's going to a probability assigned to this sentence give, given by my model, right? What, there's a one big question, actually, when I talk about the language model, and then you know, this is the question that I had, is that the, what is it good for, right? It looks completely useless. At least to my view, it looks pretty useless when you look at it. But it turned out that if you think about it slightly further, this is one of the most generic problems that you can find in machine learning. And then if you know how to solve this, in fact, you can solve almost any problem that is complicated for us to write an algorithm for. So for instance, in a very, very simple way, if I wanted to know whether people in Korea speak Korean or Finnish, and then if I had this amazing language model, which you do these days, thanks to BERT and GPT-2 and everything, which are sometimes very dangerous for humanities as well, right? Then we can use that language model to tell us whether in Korea more than half of residents speak Korean is more likely than in Korea more than half of residents speak Finnish. And then very likely, GPT-2 or whatever the language model you have is going to tell you that the score given to the first sentence is much, should be much higher than the score given to the second model, which effectively is a way for you to solve or build a question answering model as well. And then now, once you see this kind of example, then you notice that, okay, there is a, so many possible ways in which this can be used for question answering or even the dialogue systems what would be the dialogue system is that you're going to train a language model on conversations, and then you're going to ask the uh, language model, so given these utterances so far, what should be the next utterance? Is this utterance better than that utterance? That's going to be your dialogue system. So it turned out that language model or the unsupervised learning is a very generic way of solving a lot of different problems. And at least on language, it turned out that we can actually fit them and then try to solve the problem as well as we can. Now, but let's take, a, take back a, bit, a little because I want to talk about something really interesting that is called the continuous representation of the words as well as the sentences. But in order to do that, we need to talk about some very simple things such as you know, like the Markov property or the n-gram language model. So one thing that has been not trivial or the clear from when trying to build this kind of n-gram language model is that the, how can we actually build or the estimate this conditional probability when the your input side, so the conditioning part, grows indefinitely, and then there are exponentially many possibilities, and then however large data you have, you will never observe what the input is going to be. So that has been the thing that has been bothering people a lot, because if you think about, okay, how many, let's say, n grams you get with respect to n, and then the, that is actually growing really, really fast is the size of your dictionary, which is often really large, like the millions, to the power of n. And as soon as n hits, let's say, 10 or 12, essentially, there is absolutely no way you will be able to observe most of them, right? You'll never observe any of them. So what people have been doing is, OK, let's shorten it. So we're going to only say that, oh, so to predict the next word, I need to look at, let's say, pre three previous words only, instead of looking at the entire thing. So if I go back to the earlier example, so in Korea, more than half of residents speak Korean. What I'm saying is that if I wanted to predict half in this sentence, all I need to look at is not the entire in Korea more than, but I'm going to just look at more than. And then you can see that, the, like, oh, that actually is a reasonable strategy, right? If I see more than, 
in any text, I can roughly guess what the next one should be out of, let's say, millions of possible words. And then half is clearly going to be one of them. And then what people have been doing is to build a so-called n-gram language model, saying that, yeah, we're going to approximate it by the product of the conditional probabilities of the next word given only n minus 1 or the n previous words. And then once you make, it into, make this problem into this more tractable form that people believed, which turned out to be not the case, then we can try to estimate these conditional probabilities exactly and then build by building a gigantic table. So in this gigantic table, what we're going to have is the n previous sentences. So the first column is going to correspond to the context. And then the target that's going to be the second column. And then on the third column, we're going to have the probabilities for every single one of them. And then how to compute this turned out to be very simple using the maximum likelihood estimation. As we heard from Ian earlier on, in fact, it turned out that everything is maximum likelihood estimation when you do the unsupervised learning, just in a different way. It's all about the parametrization. And then maximum likelihood estimation in this case turned out to be extremely simple. It's everything is finite. So we have a finite number of words. We have a finite number of possible contexts based on which the next word should be predicted. So all we need to do is simply toast the coin quite a lot. So that's the data collection. And then trying to see how many times the coin landed has. And then the data collection turned out to be done automatically or the manually by everyone in this earth. So everyone goes into the Wikipedia, make the edits. Everyone goes to the Twitter, write something. Everyone goes to the Facebook, write something. Goes into blog, write something. And then we are creating the data for building this kind of language model every single second. I'm pretty sure some of, some of you are tweeting something, and then that's becoming the data ourselves. So all we need to do is essentially to count how many times the coin lands head. And then in the case of language model, what it tells us is that we need to just look at for every n-gram that we observe in the training set, we just count how many times it appeared. And then we're going to look at the n minus 1 gram, and then again do the counting. And then all we need to do is just looking at the ratio between those two. And then how you get that is that the given, given that we want to compute the probability of some x, given the n minus 1 previous words, we want to count how many times this entire n minus 1 gram plus the x appears in your corpus, and then try to divide it by how many times that n minus 1 gram appeared in your course is pretty straightforward. So let's take as an example, if, you, if I wanted to compute how likely university is given New York, what I do is that I go into Wikipedia, I'm going to count all occurrences of New York University, and then I'm going to count all the occurrences of New York alone. And then what I do is I'm going to simply uh, take the first one and then divide, divide it by the second one, and that's going to be my estimate. So unfortunate thing is that the, this is pretty bad way to go. There's a, there are two issues that are interrelated. One is that the data sparsity or lack of generalization. So let's think about this sentence. A lion is chasing a llama. So this is finally the continent where I can say that everyone knows llama, right? <laughs> Before that, there's never been a case where the, I gave a talk in a country where llama, or the, even in a continent where llamas were naturally growing. But I believe the, this is the continent, OK? <laughs> but the unfortunate thing about this continent is that the, I don't believe there is a lion in this continent. There are lions? No, there are, there are no lions. So and then let's say we're going to look at some historical document and then trying to estimate this n-gram language model. And then say, I want to compute the probability of a sentence, a lion is chasing a llama. And then lions and llamas do not live in the same continent, do not live in the same place at all. So then what we get is that the, the probability of A, OK, that's probably reasonably high. And then we need to multiply with the probability of lion A. So given, lion, uh, gi given A, what is the probability of lion? Probably high. Uh, probability of E is given a lion, reasonably fine. Probability of chasing given lion is pretty high, because that's what lions do. And then the probability of a given is chasing fine, but if you look at the probability of llama given chasing all, it becomes a bit pretty low. So are llamas being chased often? Probably not, as far as I can tell from reading some Wikipedia articles about what llama is. So the weird thing is that the, although every single human 
can actually tell that, the, oh, if I see a llama and the lion chasing llama, even if we've never seen a single instance of lion chasing a llama, we can assign some higher probability, probability that is higher than zero. However, for our n-gram language model, that is going to be just zero probability event. And then what it means is the entire sentence is going to be given zero probability. And another issue, the other issue that is related is that the, there, this kind of n-gram language model cannot capture so-called long-term dependencies. So let's look at this sentence. It's a very um, complicated sentence, but the, the same stump which had impaled a car of many a guest in the past 30 years and which he refused to have. Now, if you had to dis, uh, guess what the next word is after reading he refused to have, you can actually pretty much well guess that it should be removed. However, if you only look at the he refused to have, there are just so many possible words. That is, if we could tell the, these long-term dependencies or the capture of the long-term dependencies, the problem becomes so much easier. However, this kind of engram language models cannot capture the kind of long-range long dependency. And then these are interrelated. Why is it interrelated? Because the second thing is really easy to tackle, right? How would you tackle this? Just increase n. So you're going to look more further and further into the back. However, as you increase n, the issue of having a zero probability grows uh, accordingly, because we need to look at how often a n-gram appears in this whole text. But as your n grows further and further, the chance of observing any n-gram rapidly, in fact, exponentially, converges to zero. It's a very difficult problem. Of course, people have been trying to solve this by using some kind of technique of smoothing, that is, add some small, let's say, constant to every count, or trying to back off, that is, more like the Bayesian way, where we're going to say that, yeah, we're going to back off to using a n minus 1 gram, n minus 2 gram, all the way, and then use all those low-order models as a prior to our higher-order models, and so on. And then if you wanted to try it out, there is a a very uh, fascinating open source library called KNLM that you can just download and then it's going to implement everything for you. But unfortunately, that's not really, that's, that, that those kind of approaches are really uh, not that, what can I say, satisfactory because it doesn't really tell us about the actual, give us the ability of generalization. Why is that so? The reason why humans can assign a non-zero probability to a lion is chasing a llama is not because we're going to just back off all the way to the what is the probability of llama, but because we know that llama is a mammal, I think. Worse than a mammal. Llama is a mammal, and then llama looks reasonably like a deer, for instance, or the moose, no? or sheep, something <laughs> along that line. But this is good, right? And then the lions tend to eat or hunt those mammals. And that's how we know. What it means is that we are actually using this kind of semantic similarities underlying these words to figure out the fact that this probab the probability of this sentence shouldn't be zero. So how can we actually do this with the machine learning? So it turned out that we already know how to do that, and that we actually have learned today how to do so. It was not obvious, but now it's very obvious in hindsight. So in 20, 2001, Yashua Benjo and his colleagues in the University of Montreal proposed an extension of the Engram language model using a neural network. Instead of trying to build a gigantic table, what they proposed to do was to use a finite number of parameters and then trying to compress this gigantic table into a finite number of parameters. And then it turned out that it actually solves the issue of generalization or the data sparsity automatically. So let's, let's, let me say it again. So instead of building a gigantic table, and then this size grows as your data set grows often, and then what they proposed was to compress this whole table into a fixed number of parameters in this neural network. And then suddenly this neural net started to actually avoid the issue of data sparsity arising from the fact that the many of the engrams that are likely to show up in the test set do not appear in the training set. So 
in order to answer this, we need to think about why data sparsity happens. So there are, I have a two types of the answers. A shallow answer is that, you know, it's exactly what I told you. Some engrams that appear in the test set will not appear in the training set. It's just because the size of the engrams is so much larger than the data that we can obtain. The other answer, the other, another slightly deeper answer that I have is that the, it is difficult to impose token or the phrase similarity in the discrete space. So let's say you have, let's say, just this discrete space and then where they each point corresponds to each of the word or the phrases. There's no way we can actually impose anything there. It's not like the pixel intensities or so on, where there is a very natural, continuous change of the underlying semantics. In the discrete space, we don't really have anything like that. That's because of the, this arbitrary nature of language itself. So depending on which language you use, Martin, do you speak sp Spanish? What do you call this? What? Vaso. And then you the, if you speak English, you call it glass. If you speak Korean, you call it, wait, what do I call it? <laughs> so in traditional Korean, we don't really have this. I don't think so. Oh, no, 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 this is going to be Yuri-chan, yes. This is going to be Yuri-chan. So arbitrary, there's absolutely no reason for us, for me to call it Yuri-chan, or for Martin to call it Vaso, or any of the English speaker to call it Glass, in fact. You could've just changed it however you want, and then nothing really changes. So this makes it really difficult to impose any kind of similarity. However, having this kind of finite capacity model that is reasonably smooth, so how we parameterize the whole thing, this directed acyclic graph, was that this graph has to be differentiable from the end, at the, uh, at the very end, to the very beginning. This actually gives us the idea how to get this kind of similarities automatically. So what is the problem? Let's go back to the earlier example. So the problem was that the chasing a llama never appeared in our data set. So that's the problem. That, that's what makes the probability zero, and then everything became probability zero. What we see, however, is that in our training set, it's very likely that we're going to see many occurrences of chasing a cat, many occurrences of the chasing a dog, and the many occurrences of chasing a deer. So that all we need to do is, we need to ensure, or that we, need, we can hope that this language model is going to figure out that the llama is a mammal similar to cat, dog, and deer, therefore the count or the probability of llama following a chase dog is not going to be zero. And then this neural engram language model addresses this issue by learning the similarities among the tokens and phrases in a continuous vector. So that is, we start with these discrete tokens, and then each of the token is represented as a continuous vector after the table lookup, and then we're going to combine them and merge them into a single vector eventually at the end, and then that's going to be a one vector that represents the phrases. And then the weird thing is, because we're training this classifier with the finite capacity, the similar inputs should be mapped to a similar points in this representation space, and then thereby the output of the similar inputs are going to have a similar probabilities. Does that make any sense? It's like, you know, like why the word to back and so on should work. However, it's actually, it turned out that it's a very straightforward but tr pretty difficult to grasp kind of idea. So I came up with a very simple example where I'm going to assume that I only have a three examples. One is that there are three teams left for qualification. Another, second one is four teams have passed the final round, uh, first round. And then the third example is the four groups are playing in the field. And now the question is, what is how likely is groups followed by three? If I build an n-gram language model, as usual, using a table, that's going to be zero. That never happened. There's no three groups. There's been only three teams, four teams, and four groups. But what happens is that the, as we train this model, what this network is going to do is get the three as the input, map it to some continuous vector space, and then from there, this network needs to put a high probability to teams in the next one. And then now, the next example, based on the next example, four goes into this network and then map to the continuous, re uh, continuous representation, and from which this neural network needs to put 
a high probability to teams again. So the optimal way for this network to do is to map three and four to the same point, and then from there, trying to get a distribution that's going to have a high probability assigned to teams. But then there is another example, that is the input is four, and the output should be groups. And then now this is where this kind of compression behavior comes in. There is a competition. So what you want is that if from four, you want to predict, uh, assign the high probability to both teams and groups. And then from three, you need to assign the high probability to teams. You don't know whether you need to assign a high probability to groups, right? So what it means is that the, in, it's the learning of this kind of model is a process of organizing this continuous vector space in order to be as effective as possible and efficient as possible in terms of the training examples that you get. And then to do so, what it does is that this model is going to put three and four extremely close to each other so that it can predict the probability of teams given four and probability of the teams given three with a, as if the inputs were, uh, inputs were just a one thing. And then because of this, when we're trying to query what the probability of the groups should be followed by uh, following the three, it's going to actually put a pretty high probability on top of that. It's like super confusing, right? Some people get it like right this, like this. Some some don't, and then some are going to actually come up with a better way that's going to be better eventually. But so what it does is that the, by using this kind of continuous representation with the fixed number of parameters, fixed finite number of parameters, this language model is going to overcome the issue of not being able to tell the similarities between different tokens or the different phrases. Because what it does is to, it extracts automatically, based on the data, how different discrete tokens or the phrases are similar with each other or dissimilar with each other. Any questions before we move on? Okay, yes. Maybe you know we should you should wait for a microphone there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. I was thinking you are talking about uh, NLP, right? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking if you could help from uh, one ontology or taxonomy to have this kind of right. subcategories or classification of the words or terms. Yeah. Yes, so let's go back. Yeah, so this is actually a great question. Is that the <coughs> so the question is, you know, like the if the language model knew llama is a mammal similar to cat, dog, and deer, then the problem is all solved. But then you know, like the because we knew, we know already that the you know what llama is. At least you know, like the people in this continent know what llama is, right? So then you know, like the why don't we just tell the language model that hey, llama is a mammal? But that. That sounds like a good idea, and then that's actually what people used to do in the 80s and 90s, is that they did so-called classing. So they're going to define a number of classes, and then for those classes, and each of the class, there are a number of words that have the similar properties, and then whenever you need to compute the probability, and then especially if you know that the, you cannot estimate the probability well, you're going to replace it with those class tokens. So in, the, in this case, we're going to replace a llama with a mammal, for instance. However, it turned out that the, that's the issue with the rule-based systems in general, is that the, you run into an issue that you just have to add more and more rules over and over, and then at some point you realize that, the, oh, wait, hold on. God, what is the right way to add a rule that, are not, that is not going to conflict with all the other rules, so they're going to be harmonious, and still be useful. And then, still, we want to be able to tell that the, every time we add a rule, we're covering more and more space, and then there are less and less rules to co uh, cover. Turned out that that's not necessarily the case. We just have to constantly add the rules further and further. So it turned out the right way to approach is going the other way around. In fact, what this language model is learning is precisely those taxonomy and similarities that some of which we didn't even know existed or use, were useful. So what it means is that the, it's not that we need to inject the, our knowledge into these models, but we should be able to extract the knowledge out of these models because these models can see and read so much more than any individual can do.
variant property. And if you think about language, it actually does have roughly a translation invariance. That is, if I said, uh, let's say, cat here, it's the same cat as I said cat at the end of the sentence. Roughly so, right? Because there is a context dependence. However, one thing that we have realized is that the, it is not really easy to increase the size of the context by using a usual convolution. So what people have started to use in language modeling from 2014 or so was to use so-called dilated convolution. So we're going to have the first layer convolution. Let's focus on the first six, uh, wait, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven words there. And then now in the next layer, what we do is we're going to skip some of the parts when we apply the convolution. So that's what we mean by dilation. However, it's actually fine because it does these are the, all those continuous vectors that are going to encode as much information as possible about the context. And then when we look at what is the coverage of the source or the input by a single vector after, let's say, two layers of the dilated convolution, it's actually pretty large. It's much larger than doing the usual convolution because the receptive field size is going to grow exponentially instead of linearly as you stack more and more layers. So I'm going to spend some time here because as far as I can tell, talking to other speakers, no one really is going to talk about convolution for language. Uh, and as a you know, the employee at Facebook, we are supposed to like convolution because of Yan. So when you build this kind of convolutional network, you have to be quite careful, or when you build this kind of language model, you have to be very careful about the input. So if I wanted to build this kind of convolution on neural net that's going to take us to input the full sentence, and then at each location, I'm going to make this network that to output the probability distribution over the next tokens. But then what I need to make sure is that if we do not make this network look at the future to tell what the future tokens are because that's cheating, and then that also goes against the, our autoregressive paradigm that we, uh, we wrote down earlier. That is, the probability of a sequence is the product of the probability of the next token given all the previous tokens. So in order to do so, you have to be careful, careful about applying all these masking procedures. It's reasonably straightforward to implement it. However, it's all, you always make a bug. So always, when you see it, that the, your perplexity is going down really, really well, and then approaches one, then that probably means that you have a bug in your code, and then the bug is very likely that the, your model is in fact looking at the future, so looking at the answer to answer the question. So you have to be careful, and then this approach has been has become sta state of the art or the standard in many different domains, beside language. So pixel CNN that you heard about earlier, Pixel CNN works amazingly well. The probabilities it can assign to the correct images and the images that you can sample from is very, very nice. It's super slow, but it's really nice. And then WaveNet is also another example in which case that was applied to this speech. I'll just pass this one. So then, of course, Convolutional network, however big or the deep you make, is not going to capture all possible long-term dependencies. What we want is the actual infinite context. That is, you know, the, we just want to make a language model that's going to just read the text over and over and then tries to predict the next one, next one, next one, without having to stop and then say, that okay, so from here, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore it or anything. And then one way to do so, which was proposed in 2010, or actually was proposed a long time ago, or was made possible by Tomasz Mikulov in 2010, was to use a recurrent neural net language, a recurrent neural net. So what we want to do is to, we want to build a neural network or the directed acyclic graph that's going to take as input whatever has been output from the previous time step, and then whatever is the input at current time step. So it's going to look at the summary of all the previous tokens and also the current token in order to predict what the next one should be. And then this allows you to build a system that, it, that can process a streaming text very, very efficiently in the online manner because it takes the constant time per step and then constant memory throughout the entire processing of the text. So it's pretty useful in practice and then it actually is 
actively being used for the autocomplete and keyword suggestions on your phones. Actually, at the moment, if you're using the latest versions of the Android and iOS, and also the nice thing is that because it can be done online, it can very efficiently be used to score the partial hypothesis. And then now, let me see, I need to decide. So tomorrow, you're going to learn about transformers. So I'm going to skip transformers here, although that is the, the system that, sir? Today, yes, today you're going to learn transformers. I'm sorry, yes, it's always confusing. Yes. Today you're going to learn transformers later. So I'm going to skip the transformers because the idea is very, very similar, in fact, to the recurrent neural net language model or the recurrent neural net in a sense that the, what you want to use when you're trying to predict the next token is to use everything that has been there so far. And then now how you build that directed acyclic graph is pretty much up to you to decide, and then transformer or the self-attention is one way to do so. And then you know, it's always good to look at the actual code and then practice. So I'll skip that part, because I wanted to talk a bit about the back propagation through time and the, I'm sorry, wait, where are my, oh. does anybody see my mouse pointer? Okay, there you go. Yes. Okay, because I wanted to actually talk a bit about the recurrent neural net further. So let's go back to the recurrent neural net language model. So this is what the recurrent neural net language model is. Really nothing, but there is a small directed acyclic graph that's going to take as the input one word at a time and then trying to predict what the distribution over the next word is. So the whole process can be thought of as it's going to read first and then update its own memory state and then trying to predict what the next one should be. And then uh, if I look at it more detail, and I'm going to stick to a very naive transition function for now. So I have the input at time step t minus 1. And then as I said, that's going to be just an integer index that corresponds to a word in that position. And then we have the W matrix. And the W matrix is really nothing but a table lookup, as we talked about. And then we have the HT minus 1. There is a previous state. So that's a summary of what has been generated so far, what the, or the previous words. And then we have a U matrix that's going to turn this hidden state into a, it's going to rotate it a bit. And then we have the bias. And we have the hyperbolic tangent function that is a nonlinear function. And then that's going to give us the new hidden state that summarizes what has what all the words so far up to the current time step. And then given that, and then given that, we now have a softmax so-called readout function that's going to take as the input the hidden state and then trying to, trying to get to the actual distribution. And then this is the softmax that I talked about, that is you have any kind of real value vector you exponentiate it so that they're going to be non-negative non or the positive values, and then you divide each one of them by some of them, and then you get a probabilities, right? Because they are non-negative, and then they sum to one. Now, I wanted to talk about the training part a bit. So what we are going to do is that the, the nice thing about the recurrent neural net is that the, as we read the text, we can compute the loss function, that is the log prob negative log probability of the next token, and then we just accumulate them. And then once we accumulate them, what we need to do is we need to now compute the gradient of the sum of all these things with respect to the weights or the parameters that are being shared across the time step, right? So we had a W matrix and then U matrix and then B, B vector. And then those parameters were used over and over at every time step, right? Now that actually turned out to be a bit problematic when you look at what happens here. So I'm actually abusing math quite a bit here, but let's see you know, what happens. So at every time step, let's say time step t, there are a number of things that we need to compute in order to try to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to all those parameters. The first thing is that we need to compute the gradient of the negative log probability of the correct token with respect to the readout or the hidden state. And then now we need to compute the gradient of the output with respect to the HT, that is the hidden state that was used to compute the distribution for the next step. 
And then I need to also compute the gradient with respect to the u, right? There is a transition, so there was a u times the h t minus 1. And then I need to compute the gradient with respect to b and w that are going to be on the input side. And then I compute it, and then if you look here, I'm actually using the gradient of the t plus 1, so it's Jacobian of the t, h t plus 1 with respect to h t. And then that one turned out to be a huge problem. So what do I mean by that? So the gradient descent on a, this kind of sequential model has a very interesting property is that the, what you need to compute is what happens in the future if I made some changes in the past. So think about having a very long line, let's say rope, and then what I want to know is that if I, if I let's say, move the rope a bit in this end, what's going to happen at the end of this rope? That's exactly what I need to compute in order to know that, okay, how I'm going to change my parameters so that in the future, the predictability of the next token is going to be maximized. And then how we do that is that yeah, I'm going to look at every single change over time and then trying to see, okay, going backward, trying to see what was the thing that I could have done in order to make it better. Does that make any sense? Yes, yes, okay, I see some nodding head, that's great. And then once I know that, I can change the parameters. And then let's look at what I mean by this, is this. Is that the, if I wanted to know how my loss function here, j, change, changes in the after n time step by changing ht, in order to know that, what I need to know is at every time lag, how much change that I'm going to make is going to influence in the next time step. And I need to just multiply them over and over because that is the definition of the chain rule of derivative. And then in this case, what you notice is that it is Jacobian of this naive transition function or the any kind of recurrent neural net that is applied has the weight matrix coming out of this hyperbolic tangent function. And then what, I, what we need to do is we just multiply this weight matrix over and over. And then this happens with a very deep neural network as well, right? So if you have a ResNet that has a 1001 layers, you're going to run into the very same issue. And then unfortunate thing about this situation is that when you multiply the same number over and over, essentially you're doomed. Either because the number is going to be close to zero, become uh, converts to zero rapidly, or it's going to just diverge to some value because you're going to multiply the same number over and over. And then that is what we, that, that's what we mean by the exploding or the vanishing gradient. And then this actually happens with just a feed for network, convolutional neural network, or any kind of network that you train that is sufficiently deep. And then when your parameters are not configured well. But then, the, of course, you know, the, what, what does it mean for the parameters to be configured well? No one can tell. So what we want is we want to have a solution that allows us to be very robust to the choice of the parameters as well as the hyperparameters or the learning algorithm. So it turned out that the exploding gradient is not even a problem to start with because what we are going to do is that if the norm of the gradient increases as we do the back, pro back propagation through time, we simply say that nope, we're, going to, we're not going to uh, trust that one. So we just cut it out by either shrinking the norm of the gradient or simply to ignore it. Ignore, ignoring the gradient update once in a while turned out to be actually pretty much fine for the practical purpose. And then you know, at the, when, you find, when you have this kind of, let's say, surprising finding that is super simple, then you actually get an ICML paper. So that's not a bad, let's say, consequence. So that's what you do nowadays for any kind of learning that to no uh, clip the gradient if the norm goes beyond certain, let's say, threshold. But then this vanishing gradient is super problematic. So that is when the norm of this change or the, you know, the influence that you estimate into the future goes to zero. Why is it problematic? Martin, do you know why it's problematic? Okay, Martin knows, okay. <laughs> because there are two reasons, and then we cannot really distinguish between those two reasons. First one is that the, okay, so the configuration of this Wayne matrix is wrong, so regardless of what we do, this norm is going to zero. The second possible reason is that the learning's done. We're doing the gradient-based optimization, and then if 
learning is completely done, and then for this example, there's nothing you can do, or the nothing the network can do, then the norm is going to go close to zero as well. Because that's just you know, how it is. We are almost at the solution for that. And then we can't really tell the difference between those two by just looking at one example with one network. So what people have tried, or at least one person has tried, is to make sure that the network, the norm is never going to go to zero. So the, what they wanted to do was that, okay, let's make a neural network in general so that the norm is going to stay same. Of course it didn't work, right? The reason why it does, didn't work is that the, it's going to make learning impossible as well because eventually it has to learn something and then the norm has to go down. However, what this regularizer is saying is that, okay, you cannot have the norm of the gradient converge to zero. It doesn't make much sense. So that's where the idea of all these shortcut connections came in. So I'm going to use the gated recurrent unit as a, one example. However, it, this idea applies to the long short-term memory units, reg residual connections, and even to the attention module. And, the, and, because the, the, and then the co core concept is that the, we want to introduce all those shortcut connections. So if you think about the reason why we have all this vanishing gradient in any kind of deep neural net is because we have a chain of computation. And then this chain of computation implies that the, anything that I change here is going to influence the future via all these different layers of the computation. And then because of that, we cannot really train this kind of deep network or the recurrent neural net easily because it just vanishes. So instead, what you can do is you can introduce all these shortcut connections so that if I made some changes to HT here, little change is going to influence directly all the future steps. And then if, I, if my influence is direct, then I can actually tell exactly you know, what are the things that I can change in order to change the future behavior without worrying about the gradient or the, this influence back propagating vanish over time. But then this obviously is not going to work because there are just too many shortcut connections that you need to introduce. And in the case of the recurrent neural net, or even in the self-attention, the issue is that if we want this model to work with the infinite context. That is, any kind of recurrent neural net you build, the goal has to be that this recurrent neural net works with an infinitely long sequence, and then clearly we cannot create the infinitely many shortcut connections. So that's where the idea of having this kind of shortcut connection as an additive connection. So instead of introducing an actual connection, what we are going to do is that the, every time we compute a new activation, that activation is going to be the combination or the additive combination of the newly computed, let's say complicated nonlinear fu functions output, as well as the previous layer, layer's value. And then what happens is, then it effectively creates all those shortcut connections over all possible legs automatically. And then, of course, we want to do something like this, but that's not really important. So let's think about you know, from an engineering perspective. Let's say I want to build a computer, and then you know, I want to build a CPU. And then if you think about just building a very deep fit for network or the recurrent neural network without any shortcut connections, the CPU that you have built is really weird. What it does is that it's going to read the entire values in the register and then do some kind of computation. And then what it does is to put, try to restore the entire register values again. And then if you, I think everyone knows about you know, how CPU works, then this is a ridiculous way to build a CPU, right? So you have, let's say, a bunch of registers, and then if, I, if you had to use all of them for each execution cycle, and then if you have to restore everything, that just doesn't make any sense. So instead, what this gated recurrent unit or the ResNet or the LSTM is doing, what any of those is doing, is that it's going to look at a, it's only a small subset of the registers, do the computation, and then write to only a small subset while preserving the actual values as before. And then this is one way to view why this kind of LSTM and ResNets or even the self-attention type of architectures work better. That is because we are ensuring that the, our computation at each layer is going to change only a small subset of the values, and then 
all the other values are just carried over, effectively creating the shortcut connections. So does it make sense why we need to use the ResNet now? Although I haven't talked really about the ResNet. Sorry? OK. Any questions? Yes. I just would like to know your opinion or experiences in um, memory extended architectures like uh, DeepMind's uh, neural Turing machine or differential or neural computer. Oh, OK. I mean, but does anybody use the differential or neural computer? Does anyone in DeepMind use them? So I mean, like the okay. So perhaps you know, like the, I can actually have a better answer than the fact that the, no one at DeepMind uses it. But <laughs> does does AlphaStar use it? No. no. Okay. So no. So the DeepMind doesn't use it either. <laughs> so there, are, I think the there are number of different compute architectures that are available out there. Although the dominant one that we use have a separate memory. So you, you, we have the execution core and the memory core. So it's more like the von Neumann architecture that we use. And then you know, the von Neumann architecture has its own distinct advantages. And then there are people who want to bring that distinct advantage into the neural network as well. And that's the, the resulting thing is the neural Turing machines as well as the differential neural computers. However, there are different ways to build a computers. And then neural net, in fact, was born out of the idea of the parallel distributed processing. And then there, the separation between the computation and the memory doesn't exist. And then the whole point was the fact that the memory and the computation needs to be done together and then born together. So which one is the right one? I don't think there is the winner at the moment in the field of this deep learning. However, which means that we actually have to pursue both of them. But I'm more on the parallel distributed processing kind of side in general. Yes. Yes. Um, this is this goes back to uh, a few slides before when you said. I mean, this this problem of the banishing right. gradient is it's quite obvious when you multiply a lot of things that are below one stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said something about uh, the problem when the thing goes to zero, right? Because you cannot uh, distinguish between uh, convergence and just uh, uh, the t telescopic thing, right? Uh, my question is, I mean, besides what has been done, uh, what you just showed, uh, isn't, couldn't there be another way of uh, differentiation be between the two cases, like, for example, um, monitoring all the, the, the partial derivatives and seeing if all of them are at some point, uh, I mean, one may be zero or just all of them may be small and then you can say it's not convergence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm like the, of course, you can, we can always try to monitor more things mm -hmm. and then trying to, trying our best to deter, uh, you know, like to differentiate between those two cases. That is, that is, there's nothing to learn versus, you know, that the configuration is wrong. But it seems like the, so far the solution or the solutions that people have converged to include having this kind of introducing the shortcut connection so that the, we don't have to come up with a way to distinguish those two, which is not even clear whether it's possible in, in, the, in principle. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I came. I come from evolutionary algorithms. Then every, everything for me is optimization, yeah. and, and most of the talk was around optimization. Then I was thinking, why not you could use a classical genetic algorithm, for instance, to help this kind of problem related to optimization. And yeah. the second mm -hmm. one is uh, thinking about these recurrent models or network networks. Could I model the history, thinking about that many events happened? Around uh, one before another, could I model the history of one country using this recurrent model? I'm slightly confused actually there. Because usually, is for example, uh, in Bolivia, something happened before than the actual situation. Mm -hmm. And then you have like many states and many dependencies. Mm -hmm. Right, right. 
Yeah, so I mean, like the, of course, you know, the, this kind of recurrent neural net or the neural net based approach to this kind of temporal data processing is just a one way to go, clearly. There are many other ways to go. And then you know, the, often many of those algorithms uh, do belong to, let's say, those generic or the evolutionary algorithms or almost equivalently just a population based algorithm such as the particle filters and so on. And then you can definitely use them in the filtering way or the smoothing way to build a language model. So far in this kind of, it's a really high dimensional space. We have millions of the tokens every time and the length goes up to let's say hundreds if not thousands. Here we haven't found another alternative that works as well as this one. Yeah. I think the fact that this is very high dimension, we just have to rely on a very precise learning signal and then the gradient with this fixed number of the parameters seems to be an amazing thing we should utilize. So I think that that's the reason. But well, people change their mind every day, so F today, yes, that's my view. So that's why you know, we don't really have evolutionary or the generic algorithms that are used in this context that much. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so in the, the slides with the vanishing gradient problem, uh, obviously the, the, the skip connection is a better solution, but just like in the explo exploding gradient problem, why, well, I don't know if it, why, but was it tested to maybe clip the, the, the gradient as well, but not clipping exactly, but just you take the sign, and since it's very close to zero, you just take a step? Would it be possible? Yeah, so uh, not necessarily in the context of vanishing gradient, but there are a number of uh, optimization algorithms that use the gradient and often it, uh, throwing away the magnitudes, for instance, just using the signs. I think that one of the such algorithms is, was called R-Prop from like 90s or somewhere by Sven Benke and his uh, colleagues. They don't really work well. Yeah, so I think that what happens is that the often, sorry, R-Prop doesn't really work well. Yeah, but the running average is very, so what I'm saying is that the magnitude matters. So our prop, in our prop, you just throw away every information except for signs, and then it, when you try it, you, it often works in a small scale problem. So what it means is that I think that when the problem size is really small, there is a huge room of flexibility so that you don't actually follow the exact directions of the descent that much. But as your problem gets more and more complicated, it seems like you want, you don't want to throw away too much because that, that you know, the room f of flexibility actually shrinks as well. Yeah. Okay, but you know, I, th I, I, I thought, you know, uh, well, I kind of promised to talk about machine translation because I think that that's actually the only thing that matters at the end of the day for me, I think, because every problem is machine translation, right? So there was a was there? Neither the better, yes. It, um, all, 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 all along you've been talking about uh, these, these models, uh, but you, you also said that you had these um, distances between words, for example. So is there an implicit, uh, like one hot encoding in all this? Oh, yes, so, so yeah, that's a good question. So when I say you know, the, each symbol in this sentence is represented as an integer index, that's the equivalent saying that yeah, I'm going to represent each one of them as a one at encoding, where it's all zeros and then only the, uh, the element with the corresponding index is set to one. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so. Let's talk about machine translation quickly, and then you know, there are a few things that I really want to talk. I still have like 23 minutes, right? <laughs> I'm going to fill up tw two hours like completely. Wait, is that true? I thought I had two hours, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, because the machine translation is actually one of the, one of the only or a very few application of this deep learning or the artificial intelligence that has clear uh, feature of benefiting humanity. That is by reducing or the lowering the language barrier and then that's going to help with the digital divide or the digital in, uh, information inequality. So here, the machine translation is really nothing but just a language model. So in language model, our goal was to build a system that's going to tell us a score or the probability of a given sentence. But now, 
Only thing that changes is that if we still want to be able to score a sentence, but that scoring has to be context or the dependent upon the source sentence. So given a source sentence, how likely is this sentence a translation of that sentence, right? And somehow we actually have talked about every single ingredient you need in order to build a translation system, and then you're actually going to build it later today, yes? The whole thing, yes. So first, how do we represent tokens in these two languages now we have? Is one at vectors, that's precisely, there was a question is that we are going to tokenize the sentence first. That is, we have a sentence in some arbitrary way. We are going to split it, the sentence, into smaller chunks, and then it, the sentence is going to be a sequence of these smaller chunks or the tokens. And then what often people use these days is use something called byte pair encoding or the sentence piece from Google, and then those are the algorithms that gives you a nice way to control trade-off between the size of the vocabulary as well as the length of the sequence on average. So then you can now say that if you have a large enough memory, you probably want to go for the larger vocabulary. But if you have, let's say, small memory and then fast compute, then you probably want to go for a smaller vocabulary but a longer sequences. And at the end of the day, once this stage is done, every sequence to us is simply a sequence of integer indices. And you don't really have to know too much about the actual languages that are being used on the source and target side. And then encoding, we already talked about it. Encoding is really nothing but just taking as the input a sentence, let's, and then we feed it into, for instance, convolutional network or the recurrent neural network or the self-attention that you're going to learn that's going to give you a sequence of vectors. And often this sequence of vectors, the length of it is same as the length of the source sentence in terms of the sequence of tokens. And then these vectors are giving you the idea of what that word means in that specific context. And one thing that I want to just quickly point out is that the, when you think about the representation in this kind of neural network, Often we go directly into the thinking that, oh, you know, given an input, there is a single vector, one vector that represents what the input is. That turned out to be the, one of the most horrible ways to go. So what you want is that the, you want to have a representation whose size changes according to the content of the input. And then in the case of language, often the content, the amount of the content goes almost linearly with respect to the length of the sentence, meaning that we, are going to, we should represent each sentence as a set of vectors where the set, the size of the set or the cardinality of set is the length of the sentence. If you don't do that, you run into this kind of horrible situation where your system is going to work up to a certain length, but beyond that, it's going to just completely fail. And then the decoder is just language model. And then we looked at how to build a language model already. But it is conditioned in a sense that the every time we try to predict the next word, we look at all the previous words on the target side as well as the source sentence. So that is, what should be the next word or what is the distribution over the next word given all the previous words that have been generated for the translation and the source sentence? And surprisingly, it's again just a sequence of supervised learning problem. Only thing that has changed is that the input has the source sentence as well. So that's about it, right? And that's how these days what you build is a very large transformer or the self-attention model that's going to be effectively symmetric between source and the target side, except the fact that on the target side, you're going to try to look only the previous tokens and then predict the next one. On the source side, it can be the very same transformer there, right? So if I were to just draw this kind of nice directed acyclic graph that gives us a nice abstraction of the whole thing, so we have the source sentence representation that takes as the input the entire source sentence. Now we don't have to worry about the whether it's previous or uh, future because all the source sentences are effectively a sequence of the future uh, previous words. And then we have a target source representation, but this one is going to only look at up to y t minus one. That is all the previously generated tokens. And then we need to have something that's going to bind the information 
between the source sentence and the target sentence. And then given the binding, what we should get is a distribution over the next words. So all we need to do is just fill up this question mark with some directed acyclic graph that's going to combine the information from the source and the target side as effectively as possible. It was really difficult to figure out what that is some time ago, but in 2015, Dima Baudanao and me and Yoshio Benjo, we realized that the oh, one way to use it is to use the recurrent neural net and then introduce the concept of attention, which we did not call attention by then, back then, by the way. And then how we did was to first get the representation of the source sentence by using the bidirectional recurrent neural net. And then that bidirectionality is a way for us to incorporate the context that, that is the source, the entire sentence in which the word appears. And then in the case of the target side, we use the uni uh, unidirectional recurrent neural net because we didn't want to look into the future. And then given these representations we get from the target and the source, what we did was to introduce this attention mechanism that is given a given what has been predicted or the generated that is a ZT, how relevant is one of these source words to predicting the next word in the translation? And then we compute it for each and every source word separately and independently. And then that relevant scores are going to be normalized to some to one using the softmax. And then what we need is the actual single vector that is the result of the weighted or the convex sum of all these source vectors. And then that is going to give us the idea of what the actual output should be. So we have the source representations, and then we have a single target representation that summarizes all the previous tech, previous words that have been generated. And then based on that, we are going to query one of the source vectors, and then we use that because the vector is the one that is most relevant for predicting the next word. We're going to pr produce the next uh, distribution over the next one. So conceptually, this is a very, very strong conceptual process that can be used for many other applications beyond the machine translation, image caption generation, video generation, speech generation, and so on, is that the first you need to have a process by which the whole input is encoded. And then this attention is the one that actually tells us what is the subset of the input that matters at this time step. And then based on which the, we decode out the first, let's say the sum symbol, and then you repeat it over and over until you know when to stop. And then this actually applies not only to sentences, you can use this to generate images, graphs, and so on. And then this worked out actually pretty well, but I'll skip, because, oh, actually, I don't, yeah, I'll skip, unfortunately, I chose French here. And could have selected the Spanish or Portuguese and all those languages, and somehow I had to choose French. But what happened, I want to actually point out this one is that the, so this is the visualization of the sum of what is happening inside the neural network. And then what you do see is that the, you see a correspondences between the target word and the source word that intuitively agrees with how you would actually translate. An interesting thing is that the, none of these things were supervised. So we did not tell this neural network that in order to generate, let's say, economic, it needs to look at economic in the source sentence. So it just figured it out automatically by looking at the data. And then that is actually the answer to my the earlier question is that the, often when you have a large scale data, and then if you can build this kind of neural networks, what this neural network can extract out of this large amount of data goes way beyond what individual person can extract about the problem that we are tr trying to solve. So a lot of people actually go a long way to trying to incorporate the linguistic knowledge or many other, let's say, knowledge that you ha we have accumulated. But those knowledge al almost always are too limited. And if you think about the linguistic knowledge, we have amazing linguistic knowledge about English, Spanish, French, you know, like the Korean, and so on. But there are 
about 7,000 or more living languages in the world, there's no way we can collect all those knowledge. It's the, the other way around that we need to do. So these kind of machine learning tools are not only for solving your problems, but also can be a very nice academic tools that can be used by the researchers in other disciplines to figure out what are the underlying regularities in the data that we, you run into. So that was the machine translation part. But let me just finish my lecture by talking about, about the multilingual translation, which can be actually pretty uh, important. Oh, no, the same thing happened. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Because which can be actually pretty um, interesting to think about. Uh, if you're working for a system that's going to be used across, let's say, boundaries of the countries, or even within countries as well. So multilingual translation is a fascinating problem in a sense that it turned out that there is a one problem that is translation, and then that can be used for many different languages or the many different inputs. So our assumption is that we are going to have some, let's say, more than two languages that we want to translate from one to another. And then what we want is that we want to somehow maximize the transfer of knowledge. So if I knew how to translate between Korean and English, should I be able to translate from English to Spanish better with a smaller amount of the data, for instance? Right? And you do hear about all those legendary stories about the polyglots who learns to speak a new language just within, let's say, a month. And then based on that, they speak like 13 languages fluently and so on. And then the question is, can we actually build a neural network to do something along that line? That is, can we build a system that's going to learn to translate among many different languages and then using the knowledge of translating for those languages, learns to translate a new language much more easily or much more efficiently? Traditionally, that was actually impossible just to start with. So traditionally, what you do is that you're going to collect all the data that you have. You're going to build all those systems separately. And then if you have to translate from one language to another, then you're going to just piece together some of the bits. So if I wanted to translate Korean to, let's say, Japanese, no, Jap that's not a good idea. Let's say Korean to English. What Google Translate used to do is to translate Korean to Japanese and then Japanese to English to get the better translation of Korean in English. But that's not really good because there's zero sharing or the knowledge transfer between different languages. So what we wanted to want use and then what we now use is to build this kind of system. So we're going to have a single neural network that's going, that is able to consume any of the sentence in any of the many source languages, and then can translate into any of the many target languages that you can imagine. And then they, it turned out that there are two ways to go. One is to build a separate encoder and decoder. So we're going to have the one encoder for one source sentence, for, so, uh, source language, and then one decoder for one target language. And then what you do is you make a you you play Lego again. You take one encoder, you take one decoder, plug them in, and that becomes a translation system for that particular pair. But then the nice thing is that the number of the parameters grows only linearly with respect to the number of languages. On the other hand, if you have to build all possible system for the all possible pair, it actually grows quadratically. That's what we did in 2015, but then surprisingly in 2016, what we realized is that we can actually build just a one neural network that actually consumes the sentence written in whatever the language you want and then translate into whatever the language you want. And then the reason why we could do that was we realized once more that the words are not a thing. The words are not a thing. What we want is just that the, as long as we know how to map whatever the sentence you have in whatever language into a sequence of integer indices, then it is neural net's job to figure out what is the right way to use a single representation space for all those different languages, and then how to decode from that into all the other languages. So all we need is a single vocabulary that can be used across all these different languages, and then we can just use one neural net that can do multilingual translation. And then the nice thing is that we can now train this kind of system with the all available language pairs or the data. Let's say you have a very small amount of data for between, let's say, Korean and Spanish, but large amount of data for the between Spanish and English. But then suddenly now I can use 
the concatenation of the all these data points to train one model that is going to translate from uh, either one of Korean English Spanish to Korean language Spanish. And it turned out that it actually works pretty well. So this is the one example figure that I use is we just train a one single model that's going to translate from any one of German, Czech, Finnish, Russian to English. And then we just compare training the very same thing for the four different languages separately. And then trying to see how the automatic evaluation metric works and also the, how the humans perceive their quality to be. It turned out that just training one system works better than the single pair system, especially for the low resource language pairs. So if you're working with the languages that are not really well represented in terms of the availability of the data, which is almost always the case, except, except for some of the European languages, then you can build this kind of system. And it really didn't require us to change anything except for the fact that we wanted to use a multiple GPUs to speed things up. And then you can benefit quite a lot from it. And then the, this is the most, one of the surprising thing that we found is that the, in our training data, we never really had any sentence that has multiple languages embedded within the sentence. So there was no intra-sentence code switching, but we created a sentence of, with the intra-sentence code switching. So this sentence starts with the German, and then it goes to Czech, and then back to German, some Russian, and then ends with German. So oh, I cannot read a single language. So let me tell you about one thing about language research, NLP research, and the machine translation. Even if you don't speak any of those languages, it's fine. I don't speak any of the languages that I use, actually. I barely speak English. I speak really, really well Korean. Yes. <laughs> so then what happens is that the, this neural net, which never saw this kind of sentence, was able to translate this almost perfectly because these systems do discover a shared representation space across all those different languages without, again, having to give any supervision. Because if you wanted to give all those supervision about, okay, we, uh, how each sentence, you know, like the, uh, how each sentence corresponds to each, which other sentences in another language, there's no way we can cover them. There are 7,000 languages in the world. If you look at the pair, there are 25 million of them. So, um, to just wrap it up quickly, I wanted to talk about meta learning actually. Although Chelsea is going to be here tomorrow, the day after, so maybe I shouldn't talk about it too much. <laughs> However, Chelsea had a great idea, 2018, so which was only a year before, uh, uh, 2017, two years before, is that we can train a neural net to learn faster in the test time. It's a great idea. Chelsea is going to tell you all about the algorithm, but then what it means is that the, we can, you can now build a machine translation system that learns to translate from, let's say, whatever the languages that you have resources for to be fast at learning a new language pair. So in, as you can see here, for instance, if you train a neural net, your neural machine translation system to work with the French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And then what we can do is we can use it to uh, rapidly learn to speak Romanian and Latvian. And then it turned out that that's actually possible. And then this turned out to be a one way to personalize our language system for, with a neural network. So I'll just show you one experiment. So, what we did was we trained a neural machine translation system using all these languages. So we just looked at you know, translating any of those languages into English just for our experiments. Bulgarian to English, Czech to English, Danish to English, German to English, Greek to English, you know, Spanish to English, Estonian to English, French to English, Hungarian to English, we trained all the way. And then we included the Russian to English as well. And then what we did was to retrain this model to learn really quickly a new language. And then we test them with the Romanian Latvian, Finnish, Turkish, and Korean with only 800 sentence pairs each. So our goal is that the, can we use, if our network learns from all those European languages, then can it actually learn better to translate, let's say, from Turkish to English using only 800 sentence pairs? The answer is yes. It's actually pretty amusing in a sense that the, if we just train everything, 
as usual, and then fine tune it with the 800 sentence pairs. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. So the yellow and red bars correspond to that scenario. However, the purple and blue bars correspond to the scenario where we use this meta learning to prepare the neural net to learn really quickly from a small amount of data. And then what we see is that we can actually dramatically improve the performance compared to simply training from scratch or starting from the multi-task learned model. And then the interesting thing is that the, as we train this kind of neural machine translation more and more, uh, if we train it on more languages, then it's going to learn to learn a new language much more, much better. Of course, the one thing is that the, these languages turned out to be, uh, it's important to have the languages have a bit of a similarity because uh, we couldn't make the Korean to English translation work at all. That's sad because that's the only language, two languages that I speak. And then similar thing ha actually happens here as well. Once we train a model, so we train a model on all those European languages, and then we fine tune on the Turkish or the Korean with a very small number of examples. And then what, what we see is that the initially it learns how to translate one word at a time. So it's going to be word by word translation, but it rapidly learns the syntactic structure and then starts moving things around to make it look like what, uh, what the, target, uh, the intended target language is, that is the Turkish and Korean. And in these specific examples, the translations are pr you know, pretty reasonable as well. So what it's t telling us is that the one kind of, let's say, directions that people have been pushing is going for the multilingual and the multimodal processing. Because one thing that we know is that the amount of uh, representation in terms of the data availability is extremely skewed toward, let's say, European countries and the US because of the availability of the data on the internet and so on. But this kind of meta-learning, multilingual learning, and also the multimodal learning is allowing us to build a system or to overcome the issue of the imbalance in the availability of the data or the domains. So it could be an interesting thing for you to pursue. And time to finish, I guess. <laughs> yes, it's exactly 4.10. So yeah, that's what I promised. Thank you. Cool. Um, we have time maybe for two questions uh, from the audience. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. In the room. Wait, so, okay, so there, in the center first, and then the, the gentleman in the green jacket. Or, okay, yep. The, can anybody actually bring him a microphone, or if you can shout, yep, yep. Uh, so I'll repeat the questions, okay. Uh, I can answer, I can ask in the Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, what do you recommend us to do when we have applications where some tokens are out of the vocabulary? Say, for example, question answering systems where you certainly cannot have like a full vocabulary or the proper nouns in your application. Right, so the question is what happens if you have uh, out of vocabulary? Or in fact, it's a very gen general question where what is the right way to build a machine learning system that works with the things that it has not seen? during training. And then that's actually a question for humans as well, right? Um, so generally, there are a number of ways to go. It depends on the situation or the environment, uh, set of, setup in which you work in. So the one direction that I've been pursuing and that I've been using for some of the projects that I'm working on is to rely on the idea of the availability of the definitions or the examples, and it connects to all those few-shell learning and zero-shell learning, is that instead of representing each of the token or the classes as the independent entity, the entity of which representation the neural net needs to learn, what you can do is you can represent it as its property or the set of properties or a set of examples. And then in the test time, when you run into a new token, or the new entity that your neural net needs to work with, you can provide some of the examples or the dictionary definition of the new entity, and then this neural net should be able to generalize to the new entity. Right? So that's one way to go. Second way, more particular for the machine translation, is to trying to go further and further down toward the more raw representation. And then often the out of vocabulary tokens that needs to be uh, handled in the case of translation and QAs are the 
uh, named entities. And the named entities tend to not have any semantics. What we need to know is just the composition of what kind of letters are used. And then for that, if the neural net knows how to handle these letters directly, then suddenly the large part of the issue with the unknown named entities disappear. So the character-based model makes sense, or some hybrid of the character and the, let's say, subword um, sub tokens make sense. But I think the first one is the way to go. I think that's the more principled way, yes. So in the multilingual model, uh, from one, what I understood, you use the training, the translation between two language pairs to translate between other language pairs. But do you use the information of the language model of the image of the language itself, like without translation pairs, as in the, a corpus of the Wikipedia articles and the language itself? I, yeah, OK. So wait, not this one. So the question, if I understood correctly, is that the do we use the just a text without paired, let's say, translation also, as well, right? Yes. So yeah, I mean, like the in reality. So let me actually just bring up one quick thing. So in machine translation, the goal is to estimate this probability distribution, and then what we know how to do is that the, we can actually build a log linear model to estimate this, and then there we can have multiple features, and then one of the feature is going to the neural machine translation system I just presented, but another feature could be the target side language model as well, right? So we can always mix in the language model and the machine translation, and then language model often is the one for the one for the target side, let's say target language model. So that's a very standard practice as well, but better way or the more, let's say, more, more widely used approach at the moment is so-called back translation. So instead of trying to get the language model, a uh, separate language model, what you do is you're going to take a lot of, let's say, data points from the target side without any source side paired. You're going to feed it through the translation system that is going the other way around to create all those pseudo parallel corpus. And then you train the, the forward model using both the parallel corpus as well as the monolingual corpus that was equipped or the, like, the augmented with the source side using the reverse translation model. That is the technique of back translation, and that, that works really, really well in practice, yes. Cool. Let's give one more round of applause for Cho. Thank you.